Remy has trained most of their officer corps. He's nearly a legend in the submarine community. And once more, we play our dangerous game with our old adversaries in the American Navy. There's trouble in Russia. So they called us. And we're going over there and bringing the most lethal killing machine ever devised. The last time we hit this state of emergency was 32 and a half years ago during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So this is what it's all about, gentlemen. It's what we train for. A. B. N. It's headphones steel! What's up guys, Headphones Neil here, back with a very special double feature review. So for this review it's going to be a pair of films related to submarines and naval warfare. Um, it originally was going to start off with me doing a review for how or why The Hunt for Red October still holds up as a good film, but as I was finishing the film and I was looking at other recommended films to watch, Crimson Tide caught my eye because the poster looks very similar to the Hunt for Red October in passing. Um, they're both about submarines and naval warfare. Granted, they were released about five years apart, but so I was originally thinking that they were going to suffer from the whole Deep Impact Armageddon effect, where you have two movies that are very similar but with different names and a different cast. And while on the surface level, Hunt for Red October and Crimson Tide kind of fall into that similar scenario, um, they both have their own benefits as far as positives or general ideas of good and bad in them. So for me, Hunt for October is, a, is still a good film. Um, you have um, Jack Ryan helping um, Captain Ramius escape or defect from Russia to the US. Um, you have him going around meeting with, um, um, I want to say Jack, whoever his friend um, in the military was. So going around to get work with him, all these different departments to get what he needs but under at the bottom of it he's still an analyst and he's way in over his head so crimson tide while a kind of similar film because it deals with submarines is actually the flip side of that so think of the um american submarine from the hunt for october but with a more by the rules and by the book captain in the form of gene hackman on the uss alabama so for me it feels like um if you watch um crimson tide first even though it came out later and then you watch the hunt for red october as a sequel they kind of work in the same universe only insofar as you have Denzel Washington as a captain being replaced by the captain of the American sub, but um, that's only because you have two characters who are by the book, but also kind of, they don't necessarily question the rules, but they want to make sure they have all the facts in hand before they make their decision. Um, Gene Hackman kind of plays a um, submarine captain who who's kind of, you've, once you have your orders, you follow them and um, you can't stop for anything, you have to follow them through. Even if you know your rules are wrong, if your crew isn't ready, um, if orders might change or anything like that. So, on their, so kind of comparing them side by side or even comparing them or trying to compare them as being the same films um, would do a disservice to both just because uh, Crimson Tide deals more with the rules and regulations and hierarchy of being a captain on the sub on a submarine dealing with your exo your various department heads and your crew while the hunt for Red october is one of those films that deals more with having to cut through bureaucracy analyzing the data and um getting through all the red tape in order to realize that war is not always the final or the war is not the only answer in every scenario which both films I feel portray very well. Um, so you do have, and it kind of puts military, the military in a weird light that war is always the answer. But um, it also is one of those things where it goes back to the adage where um, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So that's why it's one of those things where 
that I, I kind of didn't. Don't, that's the, probably the only downside I could find in both films, is that they both deal with how you have the um, military hierarchy, not necessarily hierarchy, but just like a broad stroke painting the military as a group of people who always want to always look at war as the only answer to every scenario, and you have random. Um, people for like the um, XO played by Denzel Washington or the CIA analyst played by Jack Ryan who come in and say no no the, here's another way of looking at it or here's a scenario that you guys haven't considered and it's weird that there's no one else who considered it though their roles are one of those are the roles of you know, the people who did realize it and are trying to change the scenario to say that War isn't the only answer here. There is another way of going about the situation that doesn't lead to war and saves as many lives as possible. So if I was to grade both films, I'd give them generally a grade of an A. They were very well done. They weren't overacted. Um, they deal a lot with the uh, little things and they handle them well. So like um, in The Hunt for Red October with um, Jack Ryan and having... Or and always going back to he should have sent a memo, and being an unassuming but but his reputation precedes him as being a um, I want to say I forget if he was in the military or navy, but having recovered and finished his uh, military schooling from a hospital bed, so things like that. And then as far as um, Crimson Tide with Denzel Washington working with the communications officers and crew to get the their radar working again and using the example of Star Trek to motivate them. And then and same thing with all the rest of the crew. He tries to get the captain to understand that the crew is human, and while they may be ready just about on the brink of going to war, um, they still need to take a break or um, not necessarily have um, R&R time, but they do need to stop and get their thoughts together, have some downtime, little as it may be because if you're wound up too tight when the pressure actually comes you will, you could actually break under it so um one of the things so basically that that's why i think that both movies still hold up after all these years as good films um portrayed well by the actor and all the characters for are portrayed well by the actors who play them and granted um, a lot of the characters you, or the actors that you see in the film are names that you know, but for the time they weren't at, overshadowed by their reputation as actors or their the ability for them to draw um, audience to the theaters, even though they, that might have been the height of their star power, but, all of, but it doesn't really shine through when you're watching the films. Um, when you see, for example, you know Gene Hackman, Alec Baldwin, um, James Earl Jones, um, Sean Connery, all in one film, you wouldn't expect it to be a good film, or if it, it has the potential to be a bad film, but it is not. And then same thing with Crimson Tide with Gene Hackman and Denzel Washington. Um, there, And then I want to... Oh, actually, and I forget, uh, Stella Star, Skarsgård is also in Hunt for Red October, which I wasn't expecting, which I liked his role there as well. Um, but as far as Crimson Tide goes, um, with Gene Hackman and... Um, Denzel Washington, and then um, what's his name, who played the King um, Aragorn in Lord of the Rings, was in it. So all these names, or with all these names, you wouldn't. It could just as easily have been a bad film, but it was not. So overall, if I was to give a recommendation, I would say watch both films. They are, they do hold up, they do go by quickly, and they leave you wanting more. Um, having read the novelization for the Hunt for Red October, um, they do summarize a lot of the various elements in the film. So the, obviously, the book does have the ability to go into more detail. But what they did in the film does summarize and consolidate all those various elements very well. So you do get a good tr book to film translation. In that case, um, I don't know if there's a novelization for Crimson Tide, so it might be one of those things for me to look into and read the book and check out how that did if there is, but overall I enjoyed the film and I do recommend giving both films a watch. Um, the only thing that might not hold up is maybe the quality of the film, but they do play their parts well and it doesn't really take away from the, qual the actual quality of the film by having something that's not in you know, super high-def 4K UHD or anything like that. It, 
is presented well, it plays the part, and you are able to enjoy the films for what they present to you, and they present it well. So that's all there is for this particular review. So if you have any questions, comments, feedback, things you like, disliked, uh, stuff they got wrong, stuff they missed, or anything like that, you can find me on Twitter at PatelN01. The website is headphonesneal.reviews for past episodes, subscription links, supporting the show, and all that. And of course, now I'm back on Instagram, so you can follow me there at also at PatelN01. Um, and of course, there's still sign- time to sign up for the meetup by uh, visiting the Patreon at patreon.com slash PatelN01. Um, you'll see a couple of posts for that. Uh, and as far as all the details coming later this month in August, um, some of the background as far as what's going on there. So by becoming a supporter on the Patreon, you get early access to a lot of those details and background and stuff like that. Um, so when it comes to the actual meetup, it'll be the more public, refined version, but if you want to get into the nitty-gritty details of all that stuff, then be sure to check all of that out. So that's patreon.com slash Patel01. But that's all there is for this particular episode. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time.